And uh, so this is week 10. I think the slide deck actually on the website probably says week 9 because originally Sandra thought this was going to be week 9 content and the week 9 content was going to be week 11, which doesn't really make sense considering that's not how the labs are organized. So we kind of move things around really quick at the last minute. So this is week 10. Um, so we're going to start talking about SQL. And actually, believe it or not, the shirt's completely by accident. I wasn't actually planning on wearing the shirt today. I had somebody in my house fixing my furnace, and I forgot to change my shirt because I walked out the door just in time to get here. And that was literally the shirt, the first shirt that came out of my t-shirt drawer. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, it's, it's, you know, coincidental, but it's a funny coincidence. So we're going to ignore the first two of those because this has nothing to do with BI. But we're going to talk about the select statement and its pieces. And today will be a basic, a basic introduction to the select statement. Up till now, you guys have learned about um, the DDL and some of the DML. So DDL is the data definition language, which is the create, alter, and drop, which was last week's stuff. Um, and then DML is the CRUD commands, create, retrieve, update, and delete which for SQL happens to be insert, update, delete, and select. You guys have sort of learned about insert, update, and delete. Some of you have all been working on the labs. Congratulations. Uh, as you have discovered, SQL is really finicky. Um, and it's not like Java that explicitly tells you what you did wrong. It just says you did something wrong around here. And depending on what database engine you're using, in this case we're using MySQL, the messages are more or less useful. Uh, usually more on the less side of the deal. Um, I'm going to talk about creating SQL to retrieve data from a single table. Uh, I'm going to teach you guys about the distinct keyword and how to do some, um, how to filter some of your results. These are the basic parts of the SQL language. Um, it gets a lot more complicated after this week which is fine. So now there's no history slides in this, but I will go back really quickly to give you guys a 30 second history lesson. Way back in the seventies, some pocket protectors at IBM decided they were going to write a language to talk to databases. And they tried to patent the name SQL, S-E-Q-U-L, Q-U-E-L, like a sequel after a book. And they lost it because there was already a company that had it patented. So they decided to just call it SQL. And people still call it SQL, and it makes me want to cry every time I hear it, because that's like saying, ah, oh, I work for IBM. It's not IBM, it's IBM. SQL is an initialism, not an acronym. You don't pronounce it, you just say it. And Oracle was the first commercial database to implement SQL outside of IBM. And if you're in a database course and you haven't heard the word Oracle before, it's definitely time for you to start looking, especially if you're in computers, working for programming. Uh, Oracle is kind of the biggest database, commercial database provider. Uh, that's arguable because their sales have been flat for 10 years. All they keep selling is licenses year after year to the same customers, but you know it's enough to fund everything they buy. Um, over the years, open source service of products have come out, MySQL, um, PostgreSQL, and there's a few others, but those are the big ones. And they all implement SQL in some form or other. Uh, whenever I'm going to be talking about SQL, I'm going to try to teach you guys what's called ANSI SQL, which is SQL as generic as humanly possible. So I'll try to teach you guys the stuff so that it's not 100% specific to MySQL or to Postgres or, you know, the hell that is Oracle or, you know, the nightmare that is IBM DB2. They all have their own little flavors. They all do their own little things. But in general, they all support specific sets of commands. And I'm going to try to teach as close to that as I can so that, you know, you're not pigeonholed by the end of this class. And if I remember, you guys are computer programmer students, not the CT guys. So you will have more database courses. Congratulations, two more. Um, 
Yeah. So, not to actually start talking about what's on the slides, the fundamental command in SQL to retrieve data is called select. And it's made of three basic pieces, kind of, and then there's an actual three more after that, which will be on the next slide. Um, all SQL commands normally end with a semicolon. Uh, if you're only issuing a single command at a time, you can get away with not using a semicolon, a bit like JavaScript. But if you're going to issue multiple commands, you need your semicolons. As students learning Java, those semicolons should come pretty automatic for you. Any C-like language, whether it's Java, C Sharp, PHP, you know, actual C, that semicolon is going to be your friend. And the three pieces, the three basic pieces is select, from, and where. Now, select is where you pick what you want to pull out of the database. From is which table or tables you're trying to pull out of the pull from. And where is where you filter it down. And this is the full list of the pieces. And today, we're only going to worry about the first three. So again, select from and where. Those are pretty straightforward concepts. Uh, the next two have to do with aggregate functions. And the last one is for sorting. Um, we might be touching order by a little bit today. So the select is, no, I already explained O2. The where is what, it's a series of uh, Boolean op operators. Uh, have you guys learned about if statements yet in your Java class? I really don't know what you guys are learning, like this week. Okay, good. Well, picture this as a series of if statements, kind of, with, you know, very English-like syntax. Um, and technically, when you talk about SQL, those Boolean operations are known as predicates. So, you know, the word is on a slide. If it shows up on the final exam, don't be shocked that the word predicate exists. It's where the where clause is. And this is the actual, you know, I want to read syntax type slide. All right. So I'm going to start with the field list. There are two options with the field list which is the asterisk and a comma delimited list. The asterisks, uh, the asterisks, the star, means include all available columns. So if you're pulling something from a table, it'll grab everything from the table. The comma allows you to specify very specific columns to pull back instead of pulling the whole thing. And um, I will explain to you why Preferably, you're going to use the common delimited list as opposed to using the asterisk. My math is going to be a little wonky when I say this. So picture we have a table, and you guys know what tables are. You know what columns are because the same thing as an entity and its attributes. Let's say you've got a table with 100 columns. A bunch of them are var cars. There's a couple of text fields, a bunch of dates. So each row of data is, I don't know, um, 1K. That's actually a really big row of data, but let's just, for ease of math, each row of data is 1K. Table has 1 million rows. So you're going to do a select star from big table. And then the database server will read all this data, so 1K times 1 million, if anybody wants to shout out how many you know, megabytes or gigabyte that is, feel free. It will collect all that information and then try to shove it through a tiny little pipe at you. Now, if you're in a data center, odds are the data, the pipe is pretty big between the database server and whatever you're interfacing with. But if you're connecting from your machine over the LAN to the server, you know, that say one gig or 10 gigs of data coming down that pipe will take forever. And it uses memory because while it's accumulating all the rows of data, all this stuff gets put in memory. So suddenly you've got you know, a server where every time somebody runs a query is eating up a gig, gig and a half of RAM. 10 people, they're sitting at 10 gigs of RAM. Just 100 people, you know, it's, the number just grows exponentially, right? On the other hand, let's say all we really needed was maybe an ID, a date, and a, and a description field. So at this point, the data being returned might be, I don't know, 
256 bytes. So a quarter of the size for each row. Suddenly you go your million rows, but it's a quarter of the size. A lot less is being returned. Thus, you do the common to middle limit list because you're pulling less back from the database. The less you pull back, the faster it runs, the less your server administrators will hate you. And when you're the developer and the database administrator, you tend to end up hating yourself a lot. Um, and so select star is great when you're developing and you're trying to figure out where things are. Once you know where things are, you use the common delimited flavor instead. Uh, it's just better that way. And so here's an example, really quick, of a select statement. So select a series of columns from a table. In this case, the table is called skew data. And it would return looking something like this. This is a common delimited list. If I were going to do a star, the thing is this table has got the, the screenshots exactly the same. The picture is like another 10 columns. This is why I'm skipping through these slides uh, because the slides aren't very useful. If I do, um, in theory, what happens is when it outputs the column of delimited list, it outputs in the order that you list them. So you could go select department buyer or you could go select buyer department and it would actually switch the columns in the result returning. And this is kind of important because when you start interfacing to the database with programming code, regardless of the language you're using, what comes back to you is one of two things. You either get back an array or you're going to get back an object. And if it's an array, the array, which you guys don't know what it is yet, probably if some of you don't know what arrays are, uh, it's a list. The order of the elements in the list will be the same as what you defined in the SQL statement. Therefore, if you start playing loose, free and loose with what order the columns are, your array elements may not always return where you expect them to be. That's why you can adjust them by the same token. Once you've got it figured out, you shouldn't play with it anymore. And here's the example, right? So department buyer, buyer department, if, you, if I, when I switch between the two, and of course the screen, the actual image is different size, so it's jarring. Department buyer, buyer department, you can see that they're just switching around when you're depending on what the column order you picked. Um, right now, you guys have all run queries in MySQL Workbench, so I'm gonna skip these two slides and if anybody doesn't know, fire me an email and I'll send you a nice YouTube link that shows you how to do it in five minutes or less. So I don't need to waste 10 minutes of the lecture going over something you can watch on your own. But honestly, all that's involved is you connect to the database, you type in a command, you hit the lightning bolt. Either it's going to work or it's not. Okay. So the first magic keyword we are going to bring up is distinct. Distinct is, operates on the set of data being returned. So if you go select distinct by your department from SKU data, and if I go back really quick to these, if we look at this one originally, you'll see there's a bunch of repeated rows, right? So you got Pete Hansen, water sports, Nancy, water sports, Cindy Lou, camping, and Jerry at climbing. What distinct does is it looks at the full row of data. So if you look, it'll look at the complete collection of each column for each row. And what distinct will do is it'll say, I want the unique flavor of each combination of columns. So if you've got three columns, it'll look at the values of all three columns, find the first one, and if it sees any more repeats, it just drops them. So you only get the unique the unique rows of data being returned. Now, why, some people say, why would this be a useful feature to have? Well, how many of you are on email mailing lists? Okay, yeah, we all are. I mean, the number of messages I get through my four mailboxes a day is stupid. And some for some services, my email address is in their service more than once. Now imagine instead of sending out to all the unique email addresses, it's sent to every instance of your email address. So instead of getting, you know, five messages, I might get 25, 30 messages from a given service. Or I might get one as opposed to 50. 
So distinct is good when you need to retrieve unique sets of data where you don't care about uh, what the primary key is, that kind of thing. You just want clean, unique rows of data. Does that make, is that kind of clear before I continue? Good. If something's not clear, just speak up because I may not see your hand. It's a wide room and as you can see, I'm scanning, but I might move on. I will not be offended if you interrupt me. Now, we can also limit how many things come back, which is the next magic keyword. Limit, as you noticed earlier, I had the six pieces of the SQL statement, but you might have noticed that the word limit wasn't listed anywhere in there. Because uh, limit is a very uh, single purpose kind of thing. Its job is to literally limit how many rows get returned. Um, other database servers will use uh, other keywords, like Microsoft SQL Server likes using the word top, top five, top percentile. And these slides originally pointed to that because they were using the Microsoft SQL Server syntax because you know some of these slides are based on the textbook, which tries to cover the material on three different databases, database engines. So what limit will do is it'll stop after the first X number of rows. So if you say limit five, it'll grab row number one, two, three, four, five, and then it says, I'm done talking now. Here you go, have your results. It's a very straightforward concept. It's literally limit five rows. There is actually another keyword, which we're not gonna talk about here, but it's called offset. So you can go limit five, offset five. So it'll skip the first five and give you the next five. So you know you go to a website and you hit the next page and the next page, next, next, next. That's what that database is doing in the background. It's going, give me 20 rows offset by whatever number of pages times 20. So page four times 20, which is 80. So it'll go limit 20 offset 80. It'll start at the 80th row of data being returned. There isn't some chunk of code at the back looping through all 80 rows and then start skipping to the next one. That's not what it does. It literally pulls only 20 rows, but after the first 80. Um, but that is when you start getting really specialized. Limit is great because you can pull back the first couple of rows, especially if you're working with a really large database and you need to know what the data looks like. Instead of like one of the databases at my day job sits at about 3 million rows of data. That's one table. Not the whole database, there's 200 something tables in this database. But this one table has, last time I checked over 3 million rows of data. Sometimes I want the last 10 rows. So I literally go select whatever from this table, I tell it to order by the date in reverse order, give me limit 100 or limit 10. So I can just see the last 10 things that went in. That's what limit is for. So now we're gonna get to the hard part. So far, everything has been easy. So I'm actually gonna launch MySQL Workbench really quick. And I'll do a quick on-screen demonstration before I move on. Uh, otherwise, with the condition my brain's in, thanks to COVID, I'll forget to demonstrate this. So I'd rather do the demonstration now while my brain is still thinking about this topic. Come on. Close. And it's not working. Oh. Hang on. Okay. Please connect. There we go. It helps if everything's running. Um, as a quick aside, the company I work for during the day just, just got bought out last week and they've been installing security software on my laptop. Uh, it has not gone well. 
All right, so let's make this a little bit bigger. So, by the way, this da this database I'm using is the one for Lab 7 onwards. So in Lab 7, there's a set of instructions that say, you know, download this file, import the file into MySQL. That's the database I'm using for my examples. Okay, so I just did a select star, and you just saw how slow that was redrawing. By the way, I can't make that grid bigger. I can make the SQL bigger, I can't make the grid bigger. Um, but you saw how slow that was. That returned 1,000 rows. There's actually more than 1,000 rows in this table. Um, but essentially, that is just the straight up select star. So you saw how slow that was redrawing. If I were to just say name, comma, city, the redraw was faster because it's pulling back less data. Um, when you look down here, you can see the stats of the fetch. So the first query ran and it took 0.016 of a second. The second one ran so fast that it didn't actually register. So it pulled back a thousand, sec a thousand rows of data with almost no lag. So that's the, you know, pick the difference between picking two columns versus picking everything. The other one after this was if I want to pull in, um, I'm just going to do city, which is significantly faster. Um, I'm going to take off the limit so that we know exactly how many cities are coming up. So 8,107 cities are listed. Um, now this is either going to make a liar to me or it's not. I'm going to bring up the distinct list of cities. And right at the bottom, which is really, really tiny, so when I asked for just the cities, it gave me 8,100 and change. When I said give me the distinct list of cities, it returned 6,962. Because some cities have more than one airport. LA has a couple of airports. Toronto technically has two airports. Ottawa has two airports, although nobody uses the other airport. It's the one by the, um, no, on uh, the end of the Aviation Parkway at the, uh, the museum, the Aerospace Museum. There's an actual, actual airport behind there for like people that own their own little planes or Cessnas. There's almost nobody uses that. There used to be actually a third airport in Ottawa, right next to that one, which was where the military base was. That one's been long gone. So that's what distinct does. So it helps only pull back the unique values being returned. And the last example, which is limit, I just want 10. Instead of pulling back 6,000, I want 10. And I run it, and now here's my 10. So on one statement, I'm showing every piece of what I just finished talking about in one place, which is kind of handy. All right, so that, go ahead. The, for the 10, first 10 it finds in the database. Depending on the database engine, it will be different. MySQL always sorts by the primary key, so it should pull back the first 10, theoretically. Let's go see if I'm lying. Hang on, this is easy. MySQL always pulled by that. If you were working with PostgreSQL, it is the 10 oldest records in the database table, which sounds really weird when I say the word oldest as opposed to sorted by ID because of how, because Postgres is designed to be a highly resilient database engine. Whenever you modify a row, what it actually does is it cr writes a new row marks it as w pending. If that works, it goes to the original row, marks it as dead, and then marks the new row as alive. Therefore, you could have row number one suddenly be at position one million because it got rewritten as part of the update. Same thing with the delete, we'll do the same thing. 
So different engines will do the sorting differently, which was a valid question. Uh, honestly, I don't know what Oracle does because Oracle lies about everything it does. Um, I, was, I wish I was joking. Uh, and Microsoft SQL Server depends on, a few, on the settings of the server itself. You can actually change some server settings to change how it behaves. So it can be a bit of A, a bit of B, maybe a bit of C and a flavor of Oracle just for fun. Um, yeah, Microsoft SQL Server is insanely configurable compared to almost every other database engine. Which is not quite the truth, but we'll say yes, because it lets you do most of it through a UI. The other ones you have to actually type and stuff in to make it behave different. So there's our everything in one place command for the first part of today's lecture. And my mouse went to sleep. Okay. Yes. In this statement, the distinct will do absolutely nothing. It will use the distinct across the three values combined. So picture it takes all the values, concatenates them together, and I don't know if you guys have learned about concatenation yet in your programming class. You take one string and you glue it to another string, and then take another string and you glue it to that string. That's called concatenation. So what it basically does, and I'm really super simplifying, it actually does some weird... Uh, called relational algebra. But what it's literally doing is it takes all the values from each column, glues them together, and uses that to compare each row. So not only does it pull back, in this case, the ID and the city, but when it's doing the distinct, it'll take one and then take Goroka and glue it together. So it's actually looking at it as in it's one Goroka, not one and Goroka. It's looking at it as one Goroka. And if there's another column, it'll add that to it too so that each combination of every row is unique. So in this case, because I'm pro pulling back the primary key, which is unique for every row, distinct does absolutely nothing. Because it's going to be unique no matter what. It'll be the whole, the whole set of columns. There is a case which, uh, where distinct actually does affect only one column, but I'm going to talk about that when we talk about aggregates later. Next week, I think, uh, if I remember right. And there's only one time that distinct will operate on a single column, and that's as if you're doing math on that column. Otherwise, if it's like this, it, uh, it operates on the entire row. The whole s each row is one set of data. It treats the whole thing as being unique. Okay. Okay, going once, twice, two and a half. Okay, moving on. So now we're going to get into the meat of SQL. The first part was basically telling you how to pull stuff back, how to limit, you know, make sure you're grab grabbing the unique rows. Fairly straightforward concepts. The WHERE clause is not necessarily as straightforward. It's not that bad, but it's just not necessarily as straightforward as you expect it to be. All right. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So a WHERE clause is a series of Boolean expressions. And you can have multiple Boolean expressions at the same time. And depending on how you decide to join them up, they will do they will behave differently. Um, we have many operators. Uh, like I said, you can have multiple clauses. And of course, parentheses, show to the party, or brackets, depending on which word you want to use. Not the square brackets, the round ones, also known as parentheses. That allows you to group your operators, um, just like in Java where you can have multiple clauses in your if statement. And if you want to have two or three, you might need to you know, bracket them up. Um, just like when you're doing math, you know, you always solve the parentheses first from the inside out when you do math. So if you've got a piece of algebra with multiple parentheses in it, you always solve from the inside out, not from the outside in. SQL is the same way. So, 
SQL uses single quotes as literal character strings. Now, this is where MySQL is special because it lets you use double quotes also. Why? Somebody decided, you know what? We're going to be special and we're going to allow double quotes to happen. Um, other database servers may or may not. Again, depends on what options are turned on and that kind of thing. But if you want to be safe and make sure that your code works everywhere, use single quotes because everybody supports single quotes. But MySQL will not stop you from using double quotes. Just don't mix match. That's just bad. Um, and as it says here, make sure you use the plain non-directional quotes. And if you guys don't know what that means, you know when you're typing in Word and you hit your quote mark and it does a smart quote with a nice curly version where you got one version that goes, I'll just draw them on the board. So much easier than uh, trying to describe it verbally. Actually, there's markers there. You know, when we talk about quotes, when we're talking about programming quotes, we're talking about those. When we're talking about the directional quotes, we're talking about, whoops, that's a comma. Like that. Those are smart quotes in Word. Do not copy paste from Word. Not going to go well for you. Use Notepad. Notepad++ if you insist on having a scratch pad off to the side. Your quote marks will not get eaten. Also, make sure you use Latin quotes, not Chinese quotes or Japanese quotes. Why? Because some unknown reason, they look the same, but they don't do the same thing when the database sees them. It goes, no, what is this? But visually, it looks exactly the same. How do I know this? I was helping some students yesterday where one of them wasn't working because one quote mark was a Chinese quote and everything else was normal quotes. I'm not pointing fingers because I really don't remember who that student was. But just saying. So we just want to use the plain, ordinary quote marks when we do this. And here's an example of our first predicate. Select star from skew data where uh, department is equal, single quote water sports, close quote. You will notice that this uses an equal sign, not double equal or triple equal. Java programmers, C programmers, PHP and JavaScript programmers, and pretty much every other language out there, except for Python and Pascal, will use that single equal sign as an assignment operator, right? Variable is equal to water sport. In SQL, it's your equality operator. Single equal sign. It's important to remember that because there will be some frustrations. Especially at the beginning when you insist on typing stuff like you're writing it for Java. And then you write your, or you got used to SQL and then you go back to Java and then everything blows up. Because, and this is true of all languages, just, I like putting this warning at this point so that people no. Or okay, believe it or not, as a shocker, both of these will work in Java and in PHP and every other language. Why? Var is equal to test. That assi the assignment was successful, so it's true. Var is is equal to test. Well, that's true. So they'll both. So that's just me warning you guys about your equal signs when you when it's time to dive into between the two languages. There are differences on how they behave, uh, but this will throw you. Like I've never I've never done this while I'm writing code, jumping between SQL and PHP. No, never. There's no reason why I choose this particular example as something I should warn my students about. I've never lost three hours of my life trying to figure out why something was working when it shouldn't. So that is, you're checking for water sports, literal string. It's, it must, the word department, sorry, the department column must contain water sports. As written, um, 
MySQL is special because it's case insensitive, so you could write that lowercase and it would work. Um, Oracle may or may not. Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, and DB2 will think you're a moron uh, if you try to mix case your statements. So this is one of those cases where MySQL is very forgiving because by default, it's case insensitive. Uh, if you want to do case sensitive searches, it's actually really hard in MySQL. It's the opposite problem. And here are all our operators. We have equal. So if you look at the second one down, that's the diamond operator, also known as greater than, less than. Finally, about oh, 10, 15 years ago, we this is modern SQL, by the way, 15 years ago. We, they finally gave us not equal, just like you know C programmers have. C like programmers in Java and JavaScript and stuff. So you can either use the diamond operator or the not equal. They are syntactically equivalent to each other. Uh, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater or equal to. Um, and that one's wrong on the slide. Yeah, greater than or equal to. You write it the way you say it, not that. As a PHP programmer, I see that that's saying assigning an, an array element. Um, yeah, so the next ones are English words. You have in and not in, which actually I'll be going through some of these examples in a minute. Uh, between and not between. Like and not like. Like is for pattern matching, and that's we're going to do a couple examples of that. Uh, is null and is not null. So you'll notice that is null and is not null. I'm going to highlight that one on this slide now. Database servers are really, really finicky about nulls. And you guys know about nulls, right? You've learned about nulls, it's not kind of. A null is like Schrodinger's box. The box exists, the value inside is undefined until you look at it. A null is the same thing. Basically, you've got a space that's been defined, but there's nothing in there until you interact with it. So in databases, when you insert rows into a database, it's possible to insert nulls, as in, we don't know what's actually supposed to be here, so here's a null. And the thing is that, we use the keyword is null or is not null because it's impossible for something to be equal to null. How can something be equal to the absence of value? So if ever you're wondering why you're going uh, where name equal, like literally type in equal null, and it doesn't do anything, that's because it's impossible for something to be equal or not equal to null. Either it is null or it is not null. Thus, the last two items on the slide. I'm not sure if there's more slides about is null and is not null, but I really find at this point it's a really good one to talk about. Um, but yeah, is null and is not null is basically you're checking whether or not something is null. Not is it equal to null because it's impossible for something to be equal to null. Because the second something is equal to null, that means it now has a value, therefore it's no longer null because you open the box. On the other hand, you can say, has the box ever been opened? Which is, is null. Or has, is not null as in, show me anything that has been opened and been either set to empty or whatever. Okay, so the first one, we already did the where and an absolute string, which is the equal. In is a list of values. And it's a common delimited list with um, parentheses around the edge. And uh, basically what this will do is it will uh, give you anything that is in that list. Anything that is not in that list will not be included. And after I show the next slide, I'll actually go back to my SQL and demonstrate a few of these things. Not in does the opposite. Anything that is in this list, give me everything but these things. And some of you may suddenly realize that SQL looks awful English-like. 
at this point? And does anybody, can anybody guess why? There is an actual real business reason why it was done like this. Nope. Nope. The des uh, but that's usually the guess that I get out of the group. So don't feel bad. That's the one I usually hear. The pocket protectors were told by their managers that the SQL language must be usable by managers. No, no, I, I shit you not. At one point, SQL was designed so that a not-so-technical person should be able to go write their own queries. So suddenly, we have syntax that looks like this. So we have some pretty special syntax because of this. So we're going to go select everything from SKU data where the buyer is not in this list. Literally, if you can read it as an English sentence, there's a good chance your SQL statement is going to work. Barring syntax errors like missing quote marks or parentheses, will it do what you want it to do? Not necessarily. But it will probably run. And, you know, in and not in is the perfect time to talk about why it's so English like. So if I go to the previous slide, I go, give me everything from SKU data where the buyer is in this list. And the in statement, there's more than one way to write that one. And you can also use multiple predicates where you go buyer equal to Nancy Myers or buyer equal to Cindy Lou or buyer equal to Jerry Martin. Or we can use a nice list like where buyer in this. So I am going to jump back to my terminal here really quick. And I'm going to go back to doing my select star from airports because I like punishing myself. As you can see, this is a little slower to come back. And what I can do is I'm going to start with my first one where um, where city is equal to Toronto. And I'm going to run that. Here's all the Toronto airports. For those of you that thought there was only two airports in Toronto, you were wrong. As you can see, there are eight airports in Toronto. Actually, no, all airports is not. Toronto actually has a special code for all airports. Um, and the coach terminal and the Union Station are not, but they are actually treated as airports because they're transfer hubs. It's kind of weird. However, you can see that the, most of these are airports. So if we look at the ones that actually have the codes, we got five actual airports. So I'm looking for things that is equal to Toronto. I could turn it around and say equal to Ottawa. And there's our happy train station and the McDonald Cartier Airport. That little airport behind the Aviation Museum does not count. And the reason why this is not in this database, this is a database with commercial flights, not private flights, different airport, different kind of airports. So here's our Ottawa one. So now if I go in and I want to do my list and I'm going to go uh, Toronto, Montreal, and Montreal only has one R, and Ottawa. And now it blows up. Oh, here we go. Here's our first error message. You have an error in the SQL syntax. Check the manual. Fantastic. Absolutely useful error message. Um, in this case, because I missed my parentheses. Oh, and by the way, some of you have noticed I'm not actually clicking on the lightning bolt. And I'm usually somebody asks me about that. Control enter. For those that like are, you know, living on the edge of the keyboard. So here's my in list of Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa. So this gives me 
that's caused the most buzz since the start of the lecture. <laughs> Control enter. Um, so this is my list of airports where the, that's in the list of cities, in this list. Now if I were to flip this around and go not in, it will give me everything except Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa. And again, since I like punishing myself, I retrieved the entire thing. So originally, you will see that there was 8,107 rows. It's really, really tiny. And if you squint really hard, you can see it. After I did the not, if I do the end, it gave me 16. Then it gave me 8091. So if you do 8107 minus 8091, there's our 16. Just so you see the difference between what the in and the not in does. Okay? Pretty cool so far. Pretty basic. No, I'm not checking my messages. I'm checking the time. I am not that tied to my phone. In actual fact, you know, I really feel stupid after I did that because the Xtron control here actually has a time on it now. Like, it's the first time I've used that control panel. The, I, I'm used to the old one where there's like push buttons and it goes click, click, click. Okay. So the next one is a where clause using math symbols. And the example's correct, unlike the slide. Uh, it's showing select stuff from order item where the extended price is greater than or equal to 100 and less than or equal to 200. As you notice, suddenly there are two predicates, not one. And the two predicates are joined by the word and. So it's basically literally saying anything that is 100 or more and 200 or less, give it to me. So it'll give you everything from 100 to 200 for a price in this case. If I didn't have the end, it'd give me everything over 100. If I, or if I only had the second one, it'd give me everything below 200. But the end allows you to add more filters and it builds them from left to right, just so you know. Um, and it'll always go and first or, and then anything that's not. So it's and, and, or. So if you've got an and, an or, and an and, it'll do the two ands and then do the or. Yeah. And then if we want to use something a little more English, and somebody in the, oh, mid-90s, now late 90s, because we didn't have between when I went through school. Um, I remember the first time I saw between, my mind was blown. This... And this do the exact same thing. So extended price greater than or equal to 100 and the extended price is less than 200 is exactly the same thing as between 100 and 200. And this is an inclusive between, by the way. It means that when you use the keyword between, it includes the first and second value. It doesn't go 101 to 199, it goes 100 to 200. And some of you may be wondering why is he being anal about that particular choice of words? Because if you go not between, some people think, hey, it's not between this. So I used to have a practical exam when I used to teach this course and I was in charge of this course. I used to have a practical exam at the end for SQL. And I used to have a question I would say, give me everything in this price range inclusive. And then I have another question, and of course the, the exam was random for each student, I would say, give me everything that's between these values exclusively. In other words, excluding the 100 and the 200. A lot of people would just type in not between. No. Not between means anything before 100 and everything after 200. So anything that is not between these two values. So 0 to 99, 201 and up. Not doesn't kind of modify the thing. It literally says, give me everything that is not what this would normally be. So 
I am going to go demonstrate this really quick. And I, this, the airports one's also, yet again, another good example because it has numbers in it. So I can do the math examples for you guys. So if I go, I'm going to go work with elevation because it's nice solid numbers. Okay, so I'm going to go with anything that has an elevation of over 100. I don't know why my E is highlighted. That's weird. So that's anything that's over 100, elevation. And by the way, uh, because everything is so small, you can't really see it. But anybody who's in the first row can probably see that these are over 100. In actual fact, if there was one that was exactly 100, that would be included too because I did greater than or equal to 100. And I can flip this and say anything that is less than or equal to 100. And now we got all the elevations reaching down to zero. And yes, there are negative elevations because there are some places where the airports are below sea level. Israel is a good example. Um, so that is less than or equal to 100. And so if I were going to go with my previous example, which was greater than or equal to 100, and elevation less than or equal to 200. So essentially I'm looking for um, airports, and I don't remember if these are meters or feet. It doesn't make a difference. That is 100 above sea level to 200 below sea level. And here's our list. So we have 783 airports between 100 and 200 of elevation. I feel like, you know, when you ask a kid how many they go, how fast was that going? 300 without actually a number qualifying what 300 was. So we're at, you know, somewhere between 100 and 200 elevation. It's probably meters. Um, so as fun as this is to write it like this, honestly, Oh, I don't want that one. Come on. This will give me the exact same result. Which one's easier to read? This one. However, if I want Greater than 100 and less than 200, I can't do, use it, do it doing between, unless I want to get really, really smart, and I do this. You laugh, I've seen this done by students because they didn't want to do the opposite solution, which was because they didn't feel like writing this which has the exact same effect. So that is between. Not between is literally, you know, if I wanted to do not between, then I'd go this would be the same as writing. So if I run this, it'll give me back, uh, ah, ah, this didn't work. Can anybody take a guess why this didn't work? Because I'm using and. Is it possible for something to be less than 100 and more than 200 at once? No. So what would we use? Or. And by the way, for all you see like people, no, that does not work. No, that does not work. You type in the word or. I know, it's mind blowing. And it will hurt you because I guarantee half of you are gonna make that mistake at least once because you, had, you were doing your Java lab five minutes before you walked into my class or you walked into your lab and then you're trying to do that and they're like, why is this not working? And then you'll remember how Dan made fun of you already ahead of time. There we go. That's the equivalent. So this is where suddenly something like not between 100 
and 200 and holy cow Dan which one's so much easier to understand which actually depends on your brain if you think about it right because some people will read that and it just comes automatically and they know hey it's going to be everything that is less than 100 more than 200 because it's not between this range other people will prefer using the or because that's just how their brain is wired and you know what there's nothing wrong with that Pick the one that works for you. Now, I do have one piece of advice, though, if you're going to go the other way. So if I run this, it'll give me the exact same super slow redraw. If you go with this solution, why, what? If you're going to go with this solution, I strongly recommend slapping parentheses on it. Why? Because then you're grouping that condition as a single condition. If I didn't have the parentheses and I suddenly had an and in here, it would do the and first. So it would go elevation greater than 200 and whatever's next and then apply the or. Yes? Oh, it's because I'm breaking it up as two separate things. It does make a difference. I can write the whole thing as one giant line if you want. I mean, if you want to sit there and write a, you know, 5,000 character long SQL statement all on one line, power to you. Eh? No. It, the whole thing is treated as a single command. It ignores, uh, carriage returns are ignored. They're treated as white space. So, you know how there's a space between select star from and then after the word from, there's a space? Because... SQL is space delimited. All its pieces are separated by spaces. A carriage return is the same thing as a space. It's white space. I tend to do the or on separate lines just so that for as, as students, you can see that it's this or that, or this and that. Whereas between is a single statement, like this is between these two values. It's, it's eye candy, yes. If I want to do a, a group update or delete? Well, no, if you're going to delete it, you can't update it after you deleted it. You bulldozed your house. You can't, you know, add a new window on your house because it doesn't exist anymore. If you, you would do an update statement and you'd set the attribute to something else. Uh, I'll write it, but I'm not going to run it because I need my database to stay pristine. Uh, but if I were going to go update airports, set city equal to uh, Ottawa, where city is equal to Ottawa, that would update all the cities of Ottawa and turn them into Ottawa. Or, you know, if I wanted to go back a hundred and something years, that would change everything that's Ottawa and turn them to Bytown. I mean, in this case, turn them to Bytown. If I wanted to delete everything that was in Ottawa, because, you know, who the heck wants to come here? Airports are gone. That's it. So to bring back the predicates to last week's lecture, that's how the predicates connect to last week's lecture. Uh, update and delete can do it. Take a where clause. Everything else can't. Why? You can't filter when you're adding, because you're adding. Like, it, that's not how that works. You know, it's a bit like if I've got a piece of paper and I'm putting it in a file folder. When you're putting it in the file folder, you can't say, I'm going to, okay, fine. The human brain can do this. I'm going to put it in a file folder if it's in this condition. Databases don't think that way. It's going in the file folder. It's when you go and you pull it out. Okay, now to back to SQL. So there's our not between. So as a short version of the previous thing, I love it because I can see the slides Sandra took and then the slides Sandra took from my slides. Originally, this is one of mine, where I covered everything in the first, the previous 10 slides on one slide. Here's a short version of all of this. ID is in this list. ID is between one and four is null or is true, 
Now, MySQL does not have true Booleans. So is true will never work in MySQL. MySQL uses a tiny integer as a Boolean, which means it's like getting an answer to your significant other. Do you want to go out to dinner tonight? Mm, pick a value between 0 and 9. 0 being no, 1 to 9 means maybe. That, in MySQL, a Boolean is 0 to 9, plus null, because we might not even know. Um, other database servers that support true Booleans, as in almost everything else, you can go something is true or is false. You can also is not true, which everybody would think that means is false, right? But if I say is not true, that means anything that is false or null. Because null is also a value. Because it's no value. I know that hurts the brain a little when you think about it. The good news is, actually, technically, that still applies. Um, where a value is or is not null, um, is or is not true. Um, so you got the not which negates, which I already covered. So you can think of this slide as the summary for the previous 10 slides. It shows you basically the syntax for all those pieces in one place. And now we get to the fun one, pattern matching. So one of the things about searching in SQL is you don't always know the whole thing. Um, sometimes you need to find based on a pattern match. So you want to find all the phone numbers that start with 613 or 343. Uh, you want to find all the postal codes that start with K2C. You don't care about the next three digits. You just want to know everybody in a certain block of the city of Ottawa, right? K2C, K29, I mean uh, K2P or K2Z or K2K, whatever. So a pattern match allows you to do this. And MySQL supports one kind of pattern matching. And then it's got a second that it kind of supports, but it depends on whether or not the piece is installed and whether or not what version of MySQL you're running. So we don't talk about the regular expression flavor. We're just going to talk about like. And we have two special characters we can use. There is the underscore, which allows you to match one and only one character, and there must be something in that position. Or the percent sign, which is a wildcard character, which means any sequence of contiguous characters, and it's going to be unspecified. In other words, it'll include anything zero or more times. And you'll notice that there's a difference between the previous one I said there has to be one character there because it represents one character, regardless of what it is, whether it's a space, a tab, a letter, a number, a moon rune, you know, French characters, whatever the heck goes in that spot. One, the percent sign means something here zero or more times. Sounds like kind of a weird statement to say that, but I will demonstrate in a few moments why, what that means. So here's our handy example. Select everything from SKU data where the buyer is like peat percent sign. So this will give me anything that starts with the letter P-E-T-E. -E. So it'll find Peat, it'll find Peter, find Peterson. I can't come up with any more P-E-T-E -E names. But it'll, anything that starts with Peat. So as you noticed, uh, zero or more characters after the fact. So in, in other words, anything that starts with P-E-T-E, -E, anything after that, even if the word was just the word Pete, it would match that. Because it says, as long as it starts with this, great. And you can move your percent sign around. You can put it at the beginning, you can put it at the end, you can put it in the middle, and it's just going to change what it matches. So, in this case, we have the percent signs at both ends. So it'll find 
anything that has the word tent anywhere in it. So percent sign tent will go where tent has zero or more characters before we see the word tent and zero or more characters after the word tent. Thus we end up with half dome tent, half dome tent vestibule, and then the wide version. In MySQL, no. In Microsoft SQL Server, it depends what language it's installed in. Oracle lies. Because it stores everything uppercase and lowercase in the database. So it's always case insensitive because it stores both flavors. PostgreSQL will think you're a tool if you try to do case sensitive, uh, case insensitive matches unless you tell it to be case insensitive. Depending on the engine, the behavior will be different. MySQL is case insensitive. It's the most insensitive database you'll ever meet. It insults everyone that uses it. That's how I try to get everybody to remember about how it's not sensitive. Um, and let's just say the other database engines, for example, I just said Postgres is very case sensitive, as in if it's looking for capital T, E-N-T, E-N-T, it will find capital T, E-N-T. If I want to find case insensitive, there's a command for that to make it insensitive. So it's sensitive by default unless you tell it to be insensitive. With MySQL, it's insensitive by default and it's very, very hard to make it case sensitive. There, it doesn't have a simple way to make it case sensitive. Yeah, there's actual special commands you gotta do to make it case sensitive. It's, it's a complete pain in the butt. And it also depends what operating system it's installed on. Windows is not case sensitive. On Linux, it's not case sensitive. You install it on BSD, which is a Unix derivative, 50-50 chance it'll be case sensitive. It just depends what features they decide to turn on with the distribution. I tend to tell people, assume it's case sensitive unless otherwise. With MySQL, it's not gonna care, so you know, it is what it is. But that, is a, that was a good question to bring up. Um, this is another thing where MySQL is special, whereas other database engines don't do this. As you notice, the SKU is a number. MySQL treats integers as strings. So if you take an integer and you slap a couple of quotes on it, I'm a string now. Yeah, not a fan of that behavior as a person that works with databases all the time but it's something you can do. So as you can see right now, it's searching for the character two anywhere in the string skew. And you can see that the two shows up in each of the columns in different places. I mean, each of the rows, you know, got two showing up in the middle, two at the beginning, two in the middle again. So you can match anywhere, even in MySQL. Now, if we use the underscore Suddenly, the result set from this to this changed dramatically because it's saying, give me anything that starts, just give me anything until you hit the character two, and there must be two characters after the two. That's what this is saying. So there's two underscores after the two, although you can't really see on here, but that is what it's literally doing. It's saying where the skew is like, Anything until you see a two, and then there must be two characters at the end. So it's saying anything that ends at two something. This could be 200, 201, 299, but it'll never be 2,000. Why? Because 2,000 has three characters after the two. Pattern matching is just a case of playing with it until you get it right. <laughs> and you mix match. Um, And I'm going to go and do some examples of the pattern match now. And this one, again, the airports is great. Um, no, let's go with city. City like new. Okay, so this is saying, give me any cities 
let's start with the word new. And I'm going to run it. And it's going to be wee tiny because, you know, it's so useful. Um, and you will see that in here we've got uh, New Quay, New Castle, New Plymouth, New Work, uh, Newport News, Newburgh, New York, New Berm, New Orleans. It doesn't care as long as it starts with new. Everything else after the word new is unmatched. Now, if I just want to know everything that has two words, first word being new and then something else, you'll notice I just stuck a space in there. So what that's going to do is going to match only the ones that go with new space something. As you can see, just by adding a space in the middle of my pattern, my results are changing. Now, let's just say I want to find anything that has new anywhere in its name. And again, we got the same batch of ones at the beginning, which is uh, New Quad, New Castle, New Castle, New Plymouth. Suddenly we have uh, Cape uh, Newenham. Because the word new, the characters new, I can't say the word, I gotta avoid the word word. The characters N E W appear in the middle. And if I want it anything that ends in new, oh there's nothing that ends in new. Okay. Uh, let's go with anything that ends in city. There we go, that's gotta find something. There we go. Uh, fifty five cities that have international airports and in city. So original. Um, Mexico City, Panama City, Belize City. And the funny part is, is uh, Kansas City, Atlantic City, man, a lot of these are American. Originality, not their strong point. Um, I hope there's no Americans in the room. <laughs> That's fine, as a Canadian, I can make fun of Americans. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, now, this is anything that ends in city. So let's say I want to find anything that starts with N and ends in city. So this will find anything that starts with the letter N. There's anything in the string and then the character city. And I go run. And nothing. Uh, I was trying to pull up New York City. Yeah. It's just New York. Duh. Well, that worked out well for Dan. Uh, let's go with anything that starts with O, ends in A. Okay, I bet there's got to be more than just Ottawa. There we go. So, begins in O, ends in A. If I want to do a slightly fancier search, I could go... Okay, O, one character must be present. I don't care what it is. T, I don't care about the rest. And this should at least come up with Ottawa, if nothing else. There we go. So we've got uh, 13 cities that match that pattern. And we've got Ottawa, Ostend, uh, Ostrava, Oita, Ontario, which is in California, by the way. Um, Ostersund, Outer Scaries, and then a, and now we're getting into words I can't pronounce. So that is pattern matching. Basically, I showed you guys pretty much every flavor of the pattern match in that quick little example. Um, there you go. There's not much else to say to that. Now... There's the good old is null, which is basically, as I described earlier, something cannot be equal to null. It either is null or it is not null. If it's not null, that means it's anything but a null. If it's null, it's anything, it's null and nothing else. It's a pretty straightforward concept when you think about it. It's just the concept of nulls, the human brain does not like nulls. We don't like the concept of undefined as our um, 
preconceived concepts of as we learn. Uh, I don't think of a single spoken language that actually has a native concept of null built into it. You know, we're learning to speak as a kid. Please, somebody, there's enough languages in this room. Please tell me if I'm wrong. Because I've always used that example. Nobody's ever called me out on it. I can guarantee there's at least six different spoken languages in this room. At least six. I'm guessing, wait, nine. I'm just taking a guess, but I'm guessing there's about nine different spoken languages in this room. And the spoken language does not have a concept of null. When we're kids and we're learning to speak, our parents don't go, go by the way, here, child, have an existential crisis that there's such a thing as the ab absence of existence. It's, there's a box, but this, the contents of this box do not, does not exist because it's never been defined. You want to watch a three-year-old cry and have nightmares for a week? Because I was stupid enough to try to explain that to my four-year-old. As a programmer, and he actually liked playing, tinkering with electronics, and I, he goes, Dad, why is this not working? I go, because there's an absence of value. He goes, well, there's such a thing. <sighs> that was terrible. My wife was so mad. She couldn't understand why the kid was having problems because she wasn't a programmer. And to her, the concept of null, you know, I had to explain it to her. She goes, so? I go, yeah, but think about it as a kid. The absence of existence. So null and is not null. And now we get to dates. Holy crap. Okay. Number one, I hate this example. For a very big reason. It's written in American. Americans is the only country, well, there might be a few others, that do dates exceptionally stupid. Okay? Almost everywhere else, the dates are always in order of magnitude, either up or down. Biggest to smallest, or smallest to biggest when it's a date. And unfortunately, my sample database doesn't have any dates in it. So this will be a little bit harder to exemplify. However, dates are the worst data type to play with in a database. I kid you not. And this here uh, may or may not work in MySQL. It may or may not work in other database engines. Because, for example, Postgres is very flexible with its date formats. It, do it doesn't care. You feed it, it'll normally figure it out. Especially if you use a string like Jan, Feb, whatever. And one of the other reasons why I hate date formatted like this I'm going to write 1st of April in French. 01-AVR-2020. In English, 01-APR-2020. Now, how smart is your database engine to know whether or not you're actually talking about April or Avril? Or insert how you say April in your favorite language. Okay, dates are terrible. So this is where I always tell people if you're going to do dates in a database and you're going to play with dates in a database, always go in descending order of magnitude. And what does that mean? Twenty, o four, o one, year, month, day, biggest to smallest value. And then here we can go 12... 53, 32.00125, blah, blah. Okay? If you feed it this way, it will always know. Now, allow me to write this date in American for you. Just so you know why I have such a hate on. 0104-2020. Okay, you're in, uh, you're in uh, the UK. What is this date? First of April, right? I'm in the US, first of April. In the UK, this would be January, sorry, January 4th. Well, actually, no, the US would be January 4th. In the UK, it'd be April 1st. Because these are below 12. It doesn't know. 
Always do this. Otherwise, Dan gets mad. Uh, why? Because I inherited several databases in my career where you know we had American dates in it. And then they wanted to run reports and one of the offices was in the UK. And they go, the sales numbers are wrong. No. Just pretend you're in Boston. <laughs> and they're like, what, what does that mean? Because they never even crossed their mind how, you know, dates. So, really? So, all right. So this is searching for an exact date. You can use greater than, less than. You can use between to search for a range. And this is again where dates get special. Keeping an eye on my time. Dates get special, especially when you start talking about time. With, if you're just worrying about a date, fantastic. January 1st, that's easy. On the other hand, January 1st, 3 p.m. Sorry, 1,500 hours. Again, are you talking about North American style date and time? The date and time method everybody else in the world uses? Or like they do in the UK where they use a mix smash of the th two? Western UK uses does it one way, London does it a different way, and you know, some something, something, something shy or other does it a different way because that's just how they felt like doing it that day. So when we're talking about dates and we're talking about a range of dates, I'm gonna pull up my SQL editor so I can discuss this without having to, you guys having to read my terrible handwriting. Um, I really wish I shoved in a database with some dates in here for this. Um, okay, so let's just say I'm gonna go Totally fictional data now, just so you know, this doesn't exist. Okay, if I did everything after January 5th, pretty straightforward to read, right? And if I did, but let's just say we were including time in here. Midnight, in actual fact, we want to be really precise, midnight. I actually know, sorry, this is MySQL. It doesn't do that. Um, other database engines allow you to be a bit more precise. So like that, but I want to have everything that happens Okay, and I'm gonna take off the time. Visually, uh, and I should put an and on here, right? There we go. Visually, the human brain says, give me everything from January 5th until February 5th, right? But if it's a field that also includes a timestamp, so date and time, which, by the way, Sandra probably didn't tell you guys this, but when I teach about design, I always say always use a full date time, unless it's something that's specific that you don't need the time. Always include the time because you cannot manufacture data. Date of birth, fantastic. Don't include the time. Nobody cares what time of day you were born, except for the hospitals, right? I mean, how many of you actually know what time of day you were born? Maybe, maybe five, six in the room know exactly, you know? So people don't care. The only time you know is when your mother kept talking about how terrible the four days of labor and that three or six AM when you finally popped out, she was relieved. Man, that was a visual nobody needed. <laughs> but for fields that don't need time, which is rare, always include the time because suddenly you'll have a manager saying, Hey, I want to know how many orders were placed overnight. You know, how many webs, how many orders are placed at night versus placed during the day? Out of curiosity, I'd like to know what the statistics are. And if you're not tracking the date and the time, guess what you can't tell him or her or it. You cannot tell them because you can't invent data. So if you're tracking time, 
you suddenly have to do something that looks oops, like that. So that's saying where the order date is greater than or equal to dead midnight. And if I wanted to include everything on the fifth, what should I put in here? Uh, what was that? 11.59.59? Yes, 23.59.59. And we're just going to hope that nothing happened after the 59th second. Now, if we're talking about like a database server that's saying about its timestamps, like Postgres, we could go. And the odds of that happening are pretty small. Or, or we could get really smart and just do that. Why? Because it'll include everything that happened right up to because this is the same as writing. Okay? So date and time in a database sucks. Just so you know, it's terrible. Because there's always that edge case. Everybody's favorite edge case. February 29th, and every 250 years, February 30th. Because every four years, we magically have a new number in there, and it's a date. And, you know, if you're trying to track time and date, that's going to be a problem. So date and time is terrible, just so you know. Warning you now. You just learn to live with it. It's one of those things you will never enjoy. You just learn to accept it for being what it is, which is not fun. I've only been doing this for 26 years. So, you know, and this is when I put the aside of, I've been doing this for 26 years, and when I finished my program in college, I said, God, I hate databases. I'm never going to do this for a living. Okay, <laughs> number one job, reverse engineering somebody else's database. Number two job, talking to a database using a stupid language called progress, which was terrible. It's like COBOL. Job number three, that's the point I'm working for a big company, Digital Equipment, which most of you probably don't know who that is, but they were bought by Compaq, which was then bought by HP. Guess what I was doing? Database. Literally every single job in the last 26 years touched a database. So if you think you're kind of come out of here and not touch a database, you're wrong. Uh, even if you're going to go play a game, and oh, I'm going to go write, make games. Ha, ha, ha. Guess what? Is it going to be online? There's databases. Are you, is there a set of assets? Oh, there's probably a database in there too, probably running SQLite. Congratulations. There's going to be a database. So if any of you are going through this going, I'm never going to work that, you're wrong. Just putting it out there now. So prepare yourselves for databases. That, which leads me back to, I've been doing this for 26 years. I've hated dates since day one. You just got to accept that there are, dates are strange and you have to take into account minutes and seconds. If you're trying to grab between a range of dates, you're probably better off with starting at midnight one day and asking for everything less than the next, the last day. That way, or less than the last day plus one. Just a bit of mental math. Oh Lord, I've got 50 minutes left. Okay, working with numbers. Don't quote your numbers. Ta-da, that's it. Then you can do all the happy math you want to it. Greater than, less than, equal to, blah, blah, blah. Don't quote it and it's going to treat it like a number. If you put quotes around it, MySQL is stupid and it says, bro, this is a number, it's a string. However, I still know it's a number, so I'm going to pretend it's both at the same time and have an identity crisis. So Dan's rule is if it's a string, quote it. If it's a number, don't quote it unless somebody was stupid when they did the database design and they stored numbers in a, in a VARCAR field. But MySQL will still try to magically thunk it for you and say, oh, it's a string and it's, it's numbers. Okay. And then after a million rows, it'll hit one character and blow up. If it's a number, don't put quote marks. If it's a string, put quote marks. 
You can do all the usual thing with numbers that you expect in Java. Greater than, less than, equal to. You can do between, not between, because obviously numbers can be a range. Even more than letters. Um, the other thing is, is if you don't quote the number, the queries will run faster. A lot of people actually think about that. Well, in MySQL, it's kind of stupid because it treats everything like a string. But in other database engines like Oracle and Postgres and Microsoft SQL Server, you can still quote your integers or your floats or whatever. But what happens is it actually casts, that's something called casting. Actually, it's called coercing. It's worse than casting. It's forcing it to be something else. And it has to force every field to be something else at every comparison. Whereas if you're saying, this number, is it equal to that number? It goes, yeah. We're working with numbers here. Numbers are fast. Strings are slow. And I don't know why that's here. I already discussed this. All right, this one's important. There we go. So you can have columns in the where clause that aren't in the select. Okay. In other words, you can select certain columns but filter by something else. It's cool. Because the way it works is it goes grab everything from the table, then it scans through everything, doom pattern matching or you know, string match or whatever, builds a short list, extracts the two columns you want, and gives that to you. So if you want the human visual of this, anybody here ever do surveys? Have to collate data from surveys? It's always this one person. In the class, it's always the, her hand always goes up. It's always me. I'm sorry. I always pick on at least one or two students uh, as in every class, and you're, you're the winner today. Um, if you've ever done paper surveys, and you've had to collate the results, she's going to know exactly about the pain I'm going to talk about. You have 1,500 results. And the, whoever's in charge of the survey says, I want to know how many people said yes on question three. Three. Nope. Nope. Yes. Nope. Nope. And then they go, but I also want to just know the person's last name. <sighs> then you grab that pile that said yes to question three, and then you're going to go, Franklin Roosevelt Bob. Because the person didn't know how to read last name versus first name. They wrote their first name in the last name slot. Whatever. They're still Bob forever. But that's literally what this is doing. All they want to know is the person's name, but you want to know which one's answered yes to question number three. That's what this is doing. So if you want the physical visual, picture her with the 1,500 surveys, going through one at a time, filtering out the ones that answered yes to question three, and then she's going to list off all the last names. And we're down to the last topic. Hot damn, I'm right on schedule. Okay, aliases. You can rename, and I hate this slide also because she's, it's introducing a topic for next week in this week's slide. Aliases are ways to rename objects in the database. In actual fact, when I start talking about joins and stuff, which I think is in two weeks, I'll be talking about aliases more then. And I'll talk about them more next week. But as a short version of what an alias is, it allows you to rename things in the database temporarily. The word temporary is very important. It is renamed for the life of the execution of the query. Sounds like some very specific words that Dan just picked, which they are. Basically put, the command gets sent to the server. Server receives the command, parses the command. At this point, it says column two must be renamed to something else. Okay, we're going to store that, that anything that's in column two will actually become this. It vomits the results to your computer, and then it forgets. A bit like my brain during COVID. Stuff came out, then I forgot it even existed. And I will demonstrate that very quickly. 
Well, here's the syntax for renaming a column. There it is, you can rename a table. Right now, that doesn't seem very important right now, but I'll sh when I talk about joins, that'll make a lot more sense. As, you give it an alias. Okay, and a few more examples here. I'm just gonna demonstrate on the screen because it'll be so much better. Okay, that was the last set of slides, by the way. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my airports table because you know we love our airports table. Okay, so I did select star from airports. Again, I've told you not to do that, but I just did it to myself. And I am going to take the column called city. Again, you will see that no, most of you can't see, but right here, city is literally how it's written up here, lowercase, right? Just for those of you that can't see it, just believe, it, believe everybody else that's nodding. Now, I can rename this so that it actually has a nice name. And what, for those of you that can't see, but those that can look right here. I renamed it. Now, why is this important? Okay, back to 1996 when I was, no, 1995. I was learning SQL on Oracle 7. And the way we handed in our assignments, I hope you're ready for this, we would send the command and the results to a line printer. Because when we're working on Oracle, there was in a dumb terminal, we can stick a floppy because that's how we handed it in our work. We're usually on floppy diskettes. So you know when your lab was due Monday at 7 a.m.? You literally had to walk into that classroom at 7 a.m. and drop your floppy in the box. It really sucked because I had 7 a.m. Monday classes. When they wanted it on paper, we'd send it to the line printer, but we were required to format them to make them pretty for the managers because they would ask for reports that look something like this. Uh, city and name as airport, oh, hello, airport, come on, Dan. I cannot type standing up as you can tell, like such. And now I'm gonna run this. And now we have two nice headers. Now a picture I take this, instead of going to a terminal like this, I go, oh man, what the heck was the command? It was control, control, F3, like that's terrible how much I remember this. It was muscle memory. Control, control, F3. And then it would ask, uh, a prompt would come up and it would ask me what is the name of the printer you're sending this to? And it'd be LPR22, which was the one in my classroom. Can you guess how many times I printed to this damn printer 26 years ago and I still remember this? Enter. Of course, nothing happens. Then you would run your command and suddenly all you hear is coming out of the side of the room. And then you run over there and somebody else beats you to the printer. But we'd output and you'd see a nice column that says city with a nice title and a nice thing on the name. People would output like that and that's literally how reports were handed off to the managers. Somebody would write in a piece of SQL like this, output it to the printer, bang. That's one of the uses. Another use for this is if you want to output the same column twice. Some people think, well, why would you want to do that? I'll talk about that when I'm talking about aggregates in two weeks. But in theory, I could output city twice. Congratulations, I've got city coming out twice with two different names. Magic. Those are aliases. I can do the same thing with the table, but the table name does not output as part of the output, so it's, not, it's a little harder to demonstrate. That is that. Okay. So that is part one of select. A lot of information. I know there's some brains that are bleeding. Um, next week, sorry guys, what I'm going to about to say to you guys, I'm going to be giving you guys assignment two. The good news is as of today, plus my recording from last week, you have everything you need to do assignment two, three quarters of the way. Literally next week's lecture or the week after will give you the rest 
of what you need. So the next two lectures will let you finish off. And it is literally the last couple of tasks. So once I hand out assignment two, I'm just trying to make a final decision on exactly what I'm making you guys do. You'll have the output. Outside of that, you're working on lab 10. And thanks to Sandra's three weeks rules, you have three weeks to do your work. Congratulations. Outside of that, um, I'll see my lab people in lab. Peace. Hang on.